This episode of Yes But Why podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Download your free audiobook today at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. Amy Jordan, and this is Yes, But Why Podcast. Yeah. Oh, boy, yeah. Um, I've always been a writer, a doodler, uh, you know, pictures, art, drawing, drawing, acting, talking, but... Yeah, I, I've never put any emphasis on on any. I always wrote it off to I'm a Sagittarian, so that's oh, yeah. why I'm interested in a lot of things. Uh, I never, you know, concentrated on one thing or said this is what I do. I write for a while, I act for a while, I make movies for a while. Even when I was a little kid, I just that's what I did. Spend my time, my my. My downtime from school, that's what I did. Yeah, so like all sorts of different interests, just tons of them, soaking them all oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. How did you first get into uh, creative stuff? You said you when you were a little kid, were you making, um, you know, doing well, performances with your brothers and sisters? Do you have siblings? I have a, I have a sister. That she was into other things. She was just into art, or uh, I really, I, I don't know. My family life was not uh, of the best quality. Let's put it that way. Okay. So, uh, the my parents really didn't want any artists around. Sure. <laughs> they, sure. They're really, uh, yeah, kind of against curiosity and. Uh, any learning. I guess that's what they were against, learning. Uh, I was always a, um, a, a, a rival of my father. We, we, had, we just never like, got along because I don't know why. I, I, I went to a therapist for a while years and years ago and discussed this. And it turns out that, you know, I was like a, a threat to him. I don't know why. But, you know, we didn't get into that, into him. I was talking about me, but but yeah. So artistic stuff was not uh, liked around the house. You know, it wasn't there was no books in the house. So I oh. so basically my introduction to art was a, was a fight. It was it, it was um, I had to go elsewhere out of the house to act or to hang out with other kids who wrote. Uh, or or stuff like that. The, my my house was um, sort of a barren desert of intellectual curiosity. Huh. So you had a yeah, friend it, it then was that hard. you uh, hard. yeah. I mean that's not that's not great to uh, have no creativity no, in your childhood for sure. Um, um, yeah, it was really uh, really. They wanted a doctor or a lawyer, or, you know, somebody uh, who. To make a lot of money or take care of them in their old age. You know, I mean, sure. that was the kind of thrust that I that I was kind of getting the signals that I was getting. Yeah. yeah. So I, I did. I had to actually leave the house to, to follow my bliss, as they say. Um, I didn't start doing anything artistic uh, that that I could use until I actually graduated Syracuse University. And then I went to, that, that's where my theatrical and artistic uh, growth started. Uh, I went to Syracuse University and my one of my best friends there, not too many, but one of them was Carl Gottlieb, who wrote Jaws, you know, the, the big movie. Mm -hmm. So he was a writer. We just hung out together and, that's how I kind of drifted to the art uh, drama, the drama school. I, I was in industrial design uh, because my parents, I mean, that was as close as I could get 
to having my parents give me the nod of art, industrial design. Uh, yeah. So it was like industry, but it was design, so they okayed it. And so when I went to college, uh, I was attracted to the drama department, and I just hung around there. Uh, much to the consternation of all my other teachers in industrial design, who kept on saying, no, look, you got to pick one. You can't be a, an actor and an industrial designer. You, you can't do that. So I was kind of thrown out of school twice because of that, um, arguing with the teachers about what I wanted to do and what they wanted me to do and why, why wasn't I getting yeah, I, I mean, it was just it's been a struggle of my, until until I finally graduated, and then me and Carl uh, went to Greenwich Village. Uh, he wanted to be a writer; that's all he ever wanted to be. So I just said, "Okay, I'll just go along with him because I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. I certainly don't want to be an industrial designer, although I was good at it." So uh, we went to Greenwich Village, and he started to review movies for these small papers in New York, obscure little papers. But he was reviewing movies, and that's what he wanted to do, right? And I just hung around, uh, you know, washing duck boards at bars uh, after closing time. Uh, and because uh, that's what, I mean, there was nothing I wanted to do, uh, uh, period. <laughs> I'll leave it There's nothing I wanted to do. Really, until I, I started to hang around in uh, the uh, coffee houses late at night, either waiting to go to work uh, uh, or, you know, to clean up the bars at night, or uh, this bar at night. Or um, uh, I started going to Monday night, uh, open night nights, because we lived in the village and that's what was going on, you know, in these coffee houses. So I would and I'd say, wait a minute, you know, I was always funny in high school. I, I, I was, you know, I won funniest in high school, you know, my senior and junior year in the yearbook. So I thought, yeah, I can do that. I would be watching these guys on stage and these women on stage. Not many women back then, but and I thought, yeah, that's what, that's what I'd like to do. I couldn't write. I mean, I didn't know how to write uh, a, a joke. I mean, I could write, but I didn't know how to write a comedy stand-up routine. I didn't, couldn't get there. So I just would get up on the stage and I would just talk about my day. And it was, it didn't go over very well, but it, the interesting thing to me was why I kept doing it. <laughs> I mean, I, I wasn't very good, I, you know, but every Monday night, you know, I'd go to open mic nights, uh, when, whenever they were, Tuesday, Monday, whenever. And I started getting Good for some strange reason. I, I guess you just do it, and you, uh, I had a proclivity, I guess, for for humor. I mean, I did. I was funny in high school, although I didn't write it down. I was just like a smart aleck, and I guess it worked on stage being a smart aleck. So finally, I was opening for uh, Woody Allen. You know, from uh, Woody's uh, manager. He was a big time manager. Came into one of the coffee houses one night. I come off the stage and he said, "Hey, you got a manager?" I don't know. He goes, "Will you like one?" I said, "Yeah." And he goes, "Okay, we got one. Me and you. Okay, you know." And then he said, uh, he, "He let me do that for another couple of months. He would come in, check it, and then he'd say, okay, you know, Rick and Woody needs somebody to open for him.'" And I would be watching Woody because he was playing in in nightclubs in in the village, and when uh, the manager said, I'm Woody Allen's manager. I started to go to Woody, Woody's shows just to see what a professional, you know, he wasn't famous yet, but he was a professional. And I, you know, and he was okay. I mean, I, I didn't get his humor either. I, I was pretty naive. I, and I probably still am. But back then, I didn't get the whole hippie thing or the drug thing. But I talked about it. And all my friends were hippies. So on the stage, I would be talking about marijuana and, and, and drugs and cursing and saying, you know, fuck and all that stuff. So I, I kept on saying to my manager, hey, you know, Woody got on TV. Why don't you put me on TV? He said, Larry, you, know, you can't say that stuff on TV. This is back in the 60s, you know. You can't say that stuff on television. You, you know, you've got to get TV stuff, which I couldn't. I 
since I wasn't writing anything, I would just get up on the stage and, you know, I was getting pretty clever at telling my day in a very funny way. So I, I never wrote it down, so I didn't know what it meant. Well, I knew what it meant, but I mean, I, I, I told him I couldn't write TV material. I don't write stuff. I just get up and start talking, and it turns out to be funny. So uh, he didn't know what to do with me, and then finally I started to open for, um, a lot, a, besides Woody, because I was opening for Woody, uh, you know, word got around, and so I was opening for the Kingston Trio and Miles Davis, and, but uh, when I, Miles Davis was cool, because he wanted me to tour with, uh, with him in Europe, but I didn't want to. I didn't know that that would be cool. I, I just said, I want to leave the United States. I, I want to be famous here. So I started to open to the <laughs> Kingston Trio. And, and they're like TV. In other words, their audience really didn't like me. Although the Kingston Trio did. I, I mean, I, I knew one of them, uh, Stuart. I, I forgot his first name. But, uh, yeah, he used to come to see my shows in the village every once in a while. But I was booed off the stage, and I, I didn't understand why, but finally they started to attack me like Lenny Bruce. In other words, some uh, uh, cops started pulling me off the stage, and then uh, uh, a guy came at me with a beer bottle upside down uh, in his hand, and he, he just came at me and said, get, get the fuck off the stage, man. Bring out the Kingston Trio. You don't want to hear this crap. So I said, okay, you know, fine. <laughs> I'm not going to fight with a... He was pretty good again. He had a beer bottle in his hand. So I got off the stage and, the, you know, sat at the bar, you know, and just <laughs> pretended that I was another customer. Yeah. And so he sat down, the Kingston Trio came out. Well, no, the Kingston Trio didn't come out. The bartender came over to me and said, um, what are you doing here? And I said, did you see that guy on the... It was a, it was a nightclub and it was a dance floor. I said, didn't you see that guy come across the dance floor, man, with a bottle on? He's going to hit me, man. He said, yeah. He said, well, I mean, where's the bouncer? You know, where's, where's the bouncer? He said, I'm the bouncer. I said, well, you didn't, you know, he said, just get back on the stage. You, you have 10 more minutes before the Kingston Trio come out. I said, I'm not going out there until you tell that guy to either get out or protect me. And he said, no, you just get out on the stage and finish your 10 minutes or you don't get paid. So I said, I'm not getting paid. He said, well, then get out. So he did. I walked out and I called my manager and I said, hey, man, I can't do this anymore. So he said, well, what do you mean you can't do that? I said, no, I mean, they can't, this guy came at me. Cops are bringing, taking me off the stage. I'm not Lenny Bruce. I don't, I don't do drugs. I, it's just, <laughs> so he said, join Second City. They do the same stuff that Lenny does, only they own the theater and nobody can come at you. They'll throw that guy out. So that's what I did. I, I auditioned. Um, actually, I auditioned with Robin Williams, which he wasn't Robin Williams at the time, but I recognized his, uh, what do you call it, that bib overalls. He used to work in bib overalls, and I, I just recognized him. He'd been around for a while. So we both got in. He went to one company. I went to another. I went to, I guess, um, Is this Second City, New York? It? Second City in in, uh, in New York, yeah. Yeah, right. okay. Um, but they shipped me to St. Louis. They, they had a company oh. in New York. They had a company in uh, Chicago. And they were starting to open companies all over the place. And so one of the places was uh, the Crystal Palace in, in St. Louis. So we, we went down there. He, they formed a company with me and, you know, five other people. And they sent us down. I thought I would be in New York. That's where I saw the show and auditioned in New York. And um, they sent me to, to St. Louis, us. And we were there for, we were booked there for a month. And we were held over for nine months. So we were pretty cool. Wow. But we were in St. Louis. Um, yeah. I mean, and so finally, uh, Paul Stills who was the director of, the, of uh, Second City, you know, wanted to see what was going on. I mean, he just sent us down there. Second City just sent us down to Crystal Palace and left us there. We never heard from them. We, I guess we were doing okay, and they were getting their cut from the Crystal Palace, you know. So they just didn't bother with us. And then finally, 
also came down and watched the show and he picked me and Jack Burns. Jack Burns who invented, wrote, um, Keith Hall. Uh, where, after he left Second City, that's what he did. So, uh, me and Jack went up to Chicago. Well, now we were in the Chicago show. So this to us was big time. And yes. there I big time now. learned really mm-hmm. how to improvise and, uh, because that was, that was the home base. That was Paul Sills. That was Viola Spolin. That was mm-hmm. so close. That was, uh, Severin Darden. I mean, these were huge uh, icons back then, still to, to this day. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Bill Close is, and, and Severin Darden. They were great, you know. Uh, they were just amazing, these, these improvisers, people who worked off the top of their head. And, and also, I was a big fan of Mike Nichols and Elaine May, who came out of Second City. So, um, I was just steeped in the, the best. I mean, that was, yeah. you know, it was heaven for me. So it's the heyday of that, improv, for sure. That's where I learned. Excuse me? I said the heyday of improv, said, for that's sure. Where, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's where I learned how to teach. and and Because I, I studied with Viola Spolin, who was like, she's like the least Strasburg of improv. I mean, so I studied with her. And, and Dell, as a matter of fact, me and Dell uh, were in her class. So I was with Dell, who turned out to be a great uh, innovator of improvisation later on when, when he became a teacher and had his own company, well, who directed uh, at Second City. And I was working under Paul Sills, who was the son of Viola Spolin. So, yeah, I'm very proud of that. I'm very, you know, and I'm just lucky that. I just got there when, when all these people were working. So I used to watch them on the stage or stand out in the back. Or then I finally got in the, the show company and so I was, I was working with them. And Dick Shaw, I mean, another incredible improviser. I mean, it was just amazing. I, I, uh, it just blows my mind. It's just talking about it. It blows my mind. Yeah, what but was anyway, the um, I, what I was the show it. situation up there? How many years did you perform? Were you performing every day or um, just occasionally? Well, uh, first of all, we we had to go to class. You know, first when when um, I auditioned in New York and they sent us down to St. Louis, so we were there for nine months with, with a, a a director. A, a, he, he wasn't famous or he was, he was he was really a movie director, but he was a great director for our show, and we were held over for you know for eight months or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was I, I did know how to improvise because I learned it uh, just by being on stage every night at the Crystal Palace for nine months, eight months, nine months. So when I finally got to, and, and Paul Smith came down and he saw me and Jack were really good. Jack was really more, he worked off the top of his head as jokes. Now, um, that was looked down on. Uh, there were certain things, I mean, rules that, you know, nobody, everybody believes and believes that we were just making it up, you know. It, because it was so seamless, the rules of improv, that you couldn't tell. I mean, if you were in the audience, you know, just watching the show and they, oh, you know, a doctor you know, waiting for a bus with a nurse or, a, you know, or, or a pilot or whatever. And then we would just go and we would improvise these great shows. I mean, we were really, we were really good. So it looks like, wow, they're just making that up. But the rules, there really are rules of improvisation. You know, and you know the book by Ola Spolins, you know, uh, by Ola Spolin's book. Uh, I, I forgot the name of it now. But yeah, yeah. I she wrote that. the rules down. Yeah, and I, okay, so I was in her class while she was writing that. I was in her class when, when Paul Stills brought us up from St. Louis. Um, I immediately went into her class and, and didn't go on the main stage. We were considered neophytes, me and Jack. And even though we had been working for nine months and been, and been held over and were a hit down there. We were immediately up there and we, we went to Chicago and we were in Viola's phone's class and we had to be there. 
so I was in the class, with the, and everybody had to take the class, even the main stage people, Del Close, who was working on main stage, even he had to be in the class. So I was in, a, in a, an advanced class, but still I wasn't working, I was just in the class, and me and Del always would talk about downplay or this Viola and the way she was teaching. We didn't, we didn't like her. I didn't like her. Del didn't like her because she was a very strict teacher <laughs> for improv. I don't know how you do that. But, well, she would side coach all the time, which we considered an interruption. You know, like, you know, work with, work with your wear or, you know, you know, say you're, you're, you've lost the object, you know, remember your object work, you know, the, the mind thing. She would be always, and we would hate that. We would shut, shut up, Viola. <laughs> Little didn't know. But she was incredible. I mean, later on, you go, wow, I'm glad I studied with her. So, uh, <laughs> we, we, you know, and, and then and she was writing the book at the time because after class, sometimes classes were at night, uh, after the show or maybe during the show, uh, downstairs in another part of the theater. Um, so after the show, she would take us uh, and say, you know, anybody want to go for coffee? So we would go to a coffee house down the block from where the theater was. This is in North Town, I guess, or Old Town, somewhere. Uh, and um, and she would read us the proof, the proofs for her book that she was writing, because I guess Improv to the Theater. Is that the name of it? I, I, do you remember the, you know the name of her book? Um, uh, I don't remember. Okay. Anyway, uh, it, it doesn't matter, but she would read these things to us. And uh, I remember thinking, this is bullshit. Now, but she was reading to us in from the proof for the book that was going to come out, I guess, in a couple of months, the very things that she was teaching us in class. And yeah, we were fighting, you know, like the side coaching and the where and the whatever, and, and, and the yes and, but, but we would go along with it because it, it worked, and it, when we had to do our scenes, we did good scenes because we followed her rules, but when she was reading it, I was just thinking, and so was Dell, because we went because we thought, well, it's good vibes for the teachers, you know, she'll like this if we go to these coffee things, but we, we, we thought what she's reading is, is well. Yet we, she was we were doing the stuff that she was reading, and I don't know how I didn't make the connection or how I could not like what was being read, but you know, so well, okay, except for the side functions, she's pretty good. Anyway, it worked, and finally I got in the main company, and so I was working with with all these great people, and then uh, finally uh, we got fired. I mean, we got let go, fired, I guess. Okay. Uh, and the reason was very simple, and I probably maybe you know this now if you, if you want to show. But there was nine people. We were the last hired. Uh, if, um, yeah, I was the last hired with Jack. Last hired, first fired. We had nine people on the stage. And I was with you know Barbara Harris, and I, I just, she was incredible. As far as women go, I've never been on a stage with anybody who could. Be as funny and as real as that woman was. I mean, just amazing. You know, it was like she wasn't being funny. She was just being real, and she would bring down the house. With, I mean, it was, I guess, kind of like Elaine May and Mike Nichols. She was of that level of just improv. So uh, we were we were let go because there was nine people on the stage. It works with five people. It really does. In, in those days, it was four guys and a girl. That was the rule. I don't know where that came from or how it got that way and why it works that way. I don't know. If it, I've never been in a show where there was two guys and three girls or one guy and four girls. There was always four guys and one girl. I have no idea why that was, except machoism. I, machoism was in the I don't know. It never, it never reared its head that way. I but I always wondered about that. I really did. Uh, even when we went to, so I, we, so I hung around with Jack. Yeah, he went on to Hollywood and wrote Hee Haw from there. 
Uh, and I did you teach in, for a little while. Yeah, I was going to say, is did you teach and did you teach something different? You mentioned that, you know, you guys had a hard time with the style, um, you know, that Viola was doing. But did you right. end up going off to the side with Dell and teaching something different? You mentioned teaching, and I just wondered, did you teach at Second oh, City oh, that or was did a, you that teach, was, like, later? That was years later. That was – I uh, – I was just, a, a, you know, an actor who just wanted to improv for the rest of my life in Second City. I mean, oh, right I on. love, I still do. I, I love yeah. I can't do it anymore, by the way. You have to, because I haven't improvised in years. Yeah. That's a muscle, man. you got, you got yeah. to do that. you got to do that. Uh, or it just goes away. It's, 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 okay, so um, me and Jay, we were let go. Jack and I were let go. Uh, and I... I hung around Second City and, and slept on um, uh, on one of the actors' couches because uh, I, I, I didn't have any money sure. once I was fired from Second City. So I stayed there for about a month. I would come down and hang out, you know, at night because I had no, no place else to go. I was trying to figure out should I go back to New York, should I go to the West Coast to Hollywood, try to be an actor. So I was just on this guy's couch and. Um, so after the show or during the show, they, were, they had a bar downstairs in the theater, the second city in Chicago, they had a bar downstairs. And uh, so I would hang out with the, with the people, with the actors who either were in a class or who were in the show but weren't on for a while. So they would go down and just hang in the bar until they get a cue from a microphone. Hey, you know, Larry, come up here. You know, you're in the next scene. So I would be and in walks somebody, comes in and says, there's a Larry Hank in here. So I go, yeah, that's me, what? He says, there's a car outside, there's some people want to talk to you. So I go outside, and it was the middle of the winter. I think it was like a very slight snow outside. I remember it was, it was cold, it was freezing outside. And I just, because I just ran out, and, you know, cold, I just ran outside, and I... And there was all these people who turned out to be the committee later on in, in, in uh, San Francisco. But now they were in this car in second uh, outside. And Alan Meyerson, the director, who was the director who auditioned uh, who who auditioned me, uh, one of the people who auditioned me in New York to get the job to go to St. Louis. So Alan Myers is in this car in Chicago, and four strange people I'd never seen before. And the top of the car, it was like a station one, and the top of the car was full of luggage, just tied down, suitcases and eggs and stuff. And the car was crowded. There was like four, five people. There was two kids, I think, in the car. And it was just jammed. And Alan said, hey, we're going. I heard you were fired. We're going. He had just, they were just left from New York. He was running the company in New York uh, all, all the time, even when I was at St. Louis. They had quit. He had quit and taken four of his best students with him uh, and their families, their wife and kid, kids. And they were going to San Francisco to open up their own theater called the committee. And they wanted me in because he remembered me from one of the classes he taught in New York. So, uh, and he said, you know, he thought I was pretty good. So he said, hey, you know, you want to, you need another person. Let's go. And I said, no, I'm not getting in that car. I don't know where you're going. Yeah, San Francisco. Yeah, right, sure. No, I'm not going. Until you send me a ticket, I'm not getting in this car. There's too many people. And there really was. I mean, it was, it was packed. Uh, they were even glad I would get in. So they did. They sent me a ticket. Um, I, I waited. They, so they drove off into the night. You know, I thought, well, I'll never see that of them again. But I did give him my address in New York, um, and sure enough, it's, so I went back to New York. I, just, I guess I took a bus or a flu. God knows where I got the money from. Anyway, back in New York, I got a ticket. I, he, I, they actually sent me a plane ticket. So I, well, I wasn't doing anything. I was, you know, back to doing stand-up in coffee houses and stuff. Uh, Chris, uh, my manager just uh, thought, I was set. I was set in improvising. He had told me, you know, during during the, the uh, Second City, so he couldn't book me anymore. 
because I lost all the momentum I had. And so I went to Chicago. I went to second. Uh, getting it all mixed up now. I went to San Francisco yeah. with the committee. I flew there. They were building a theater, so we didn't even know if this was going to be a success. They had raised enough money to renovate uh, a Chinese supermarket or a bocce ball court. That's what it was. Yeah. They renovated a Chinese bocce ball court in San Francisco, in North Beach, and were building a theater. So we didn't even know if we had jobs, really. And we were all living together in one, one apartment, a big railroad flat, all of us, families, five, five acts, six actors, two kids, wives, uh, and the director and his wife. And then we opened and we were, you know, we struggled a little, struggled a little. In the beginning, we only, you know, if, if, if the, the rule was, this is how, this is how we struggled. If, the, if there was more people in the company than there was in the audience, we didn't have to do a show. <laughs> so we did that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I hear so that. So we had those rules. <laughs> uh, and then finally it started to build and we started to get great reviews. And then one day, I'll never forget this, man. It was one of the highlights of my life. Is, uh, we were waiting backstage to open. It was like a Saturday night or something. And I was with Hamilton Camp, I remember that. He was my best friend in the company. And from how, from, uh, he was a folk singer, I think, but, you know, before he he got into the community. I said, Hamilton, come outside. You gotta see this. You gotta see this. He said, what? 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 I said, just come outside. Come outside. So I said, okay, you know, we had about 15, 20 minutes before the show was on. So we walked out uh, out into the Columbus uh, Boulevard uh, Avenue, uh, where our theater was, and we looked. We walked outside, went across the street, and there was a line for the committee around the block. It was amazing. It was the first time that we had, I'd ever seen anything like that. And from then on, we were just a smash hit. But it went around the block, not just around the corner, around. One, we walked it, you know, one corner, one corner, one corner. And it just almost came around the fourth corner. It was amazing. Awesome. Uh, just, and from then on, we were just the hit of San Francisco. And I, again, I thought, well, I'll be here for the rest of my life. This is cool. And we were the hit of San Francisco and everything like that. And we were there for a long time, years. And then everybody, because it was only... I think 15 or 20 bucks round trip to fly up from Hollywood to San Francisco, from L.A. to San Francisco. So a lot of stars uh, and important people, you know, they would hear about this amazing show, like Second City, but up in San Francisco called The Committee. And they would fly up and they would uh, see the show and then start hiring us, you know, to come down and do sitcoms down there. But they didn't like improv. They just wanted because we're talented and funny. Uh, so we would fly down every once in a while, uh, you know, and then back. And it was only 20 bucks, and that was really, really cool. You fly down for three days, you come back. Since it was an improv show, as you probably know, anybody could fill in for anybody else, so nobody was ever missing. My fear was that I could be replaced. Because anybody could be replaced. We're all being replaced by when we go down for three days to do one day of shooting. Come back and somebody would do your part or improvise a different ending to it or whatever. So I was in constant fear of being replaced. I, you know, I guess kind of just you, you, no confidence in myself, really. But I, you know, I never was. Every time I come back, I just get back in the show and replace somebody else who went down there. But I never got over that. And finally, the entire company had been replaced by permanently moving to. Hollywood and making some good bucks. I just wanted to stay in, uh, in San Francisco. And then finally, um, I, I started directing. And that's what I did because I was now the senior member of the committee. So I was directing shows and that was boring. And I remember doing an interview and they said, you know, what, what's the difference between, you know, you used to be a big star, you know, you, you, you know, with the rest of the company, you were big stars here. 
Well, what's the difference? Now you're directing. You're not on stage. Now you're directing your own company. What, you know, how does that feel? And I remember he quoted it. Uh, he, I said, it, it's very frustrating. He said, why? I said, because I just feel like there's five people uh, between me and the audience. Because I know where the scene should go. You know, I'm watching it. I'm directing it. And you can't do that. That's one of the rules. All right, talk about teaching. Here's what I learned. And, and actually, Alan Meyerson told me this. Because when he left, I said, you know, can you give me any hints about directing, you know, improv? And he said, okay, I'll give you just, just one rule. You can't take any, I mean, you're going to be watching these scenes. You're going to be directing them. You're going to be adjusting them. You can see where the scene should go because you're standing outside. You're watching them every night. You can see, well, it should go here. You can even formulate how it should end the whole thing. You can't tell them that. You can't interfere with that. But he said, here's the rule. The rule is that all improv scenes, there's only a finite number of ways after a certain, I mean, if you can see that the scene is a success, so let's do it again tomorrow night, you know, try it another way. But there's, there's somewhere, there's, there's, a, there's a, a seed of an idea there, of a, of a good scene there. Once you understand that, the rule applies, there's only a, a finite amount of ways this scene can go where it can be a success. You don't know the amount, but all you, all you have to know is there's a finite way. There's only a certain amount of ways. So, under that guise, what you do is you say, do it again. And just tell them to keep doing it again or, or make an adjustment. You know, instead of, uh, you know, talking about that, talk about this. Just try to do it. But eventually, because there's a finite number of ways, they will come upon it. It may take you a week. It may take you two months. I mean, sometimes we would work on a, a really great scene for about three or four months before we'd ever put it in the show. Just each night we would improvise it or we would work on it in rehearsal. Never write anything down. Just, you know, just do it again or do it this way. And then finally they would hit it. They would go, you would see it. And they would go, oh man, one more. Boom, they got it. Okay. And then they would say, okay, let's just, uh, that's it. You got, we got it. We're putting it in the show. You, see, you can never take, um, uh, well, you can never own it. You can never say, yeah, I knew it was going to go that way, you know, two months ago. You, you just, you can't take that away from him. So he says, but, he says, so I said, well, what do you, how do you get off? You know, how, how, well, what's in it for you then as the director? He said, well, you knew, that's all. That, that's your, that, that's your reward. You knew <laughs> it was going to work and you knew probably it was. And that, that was a great thing for him to tell me, even about life. It was just great. But it worked. And, and I, I, I directed there for about uh, two shows. I opened two shows uh, over, I don't know, six, six or seven months. And, um, and, and then I finally, you know, finally went down to Hollywood because uh, there was money down there. You know? Succumbed to the siren song. With, yeah, but also I wasn't I wasn't working. I mean, sure. I'm, I'm a performer, you know, and yeah. it just I I didn't I wasn't getting up. I wasn't getting my reward. I wasn't yeah making it funny, you know, the first night, not after six months of working through them. I have five people in between me and the audience. I'll never forget that interview because uh, I, I heard myself say it, and it kind of woke me up, you know. So, so then for I you, just put down the um. That. So for you, like the creative process of performing is the most fulfilling. Like when you get to create and and present something to an audience, that's your that's what really you love the most. The creative process is my reward. It doesn't matter about acting or making a painting or um, you know a, a, making a film. I make films, you know, little little, little comedy films. Making it, the making of it, uh, the process, process. I'm all about process. Uh, yeah. And I think that's the key to to everything. Even if you want to be a doctor, process, the process, doing it. You, I, I think, I don't know, you know, there's a bunch of cliches if you look for any book, you know, 
doing it is where it's at. That, that, that's it, man. <laughs> that's yeah. right. You to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and you get better. And, uh, and, and concentration, focus. In other words, the desire. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Desire. Desire and process. you yeah. got to want to do it. You can't force yourself to do it. I mean, if you don't want to do it, it's not going to go in. And that's just I'm speaking for, from personal. If I don't want to do something, you can teach me until the apocalypse. And I ain't going to learn it. I mean, even if I tell you I want to, or it's in my best interest that I learn this. No, I mean, it's like my parents, you know? Yeah. No, I'm, I, I'm not going to be a doctor. That's, you can, I don't, <laughs> no. Uh, and, and so the price of being a reward, it's it, it kind of a double-edged sword, kind of a curse and a, and a, a great thing. Because uh, money is not, you can't bribe me. And, unless it's a lot of money, then sure. <laughs> I mean, not sure, but, sure. But uh, I'm not, I, I'm not, that's not where I, I'm at. You yeah. Know? Uh, I like money. Sure. It, it frees you up to do a lot of things you do like. But, but that's not the, the, the key. I was playing, um, yeah, focus. I mean, in other words, if you, the, the desire helps you focus, and focus is what needed to conquer or, or absorb the process. That, that seems to be it. And if you like what you're doing, man, you're home free. That, that's where you got to be. Is you got to like what you're doing. And if you like what you're doing, the rest is just, hey, well, okay. Yeah. I'll, get, I'll get through this part because I love the other stuff about it. I mean, it's just a lot of stuff. I mean, acting, like for acting, the downside of acting is memorizing the line. Yeah. Who wants to memorize the line? Oh, man. Forget <laughs> it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they always reward me. Like, I did a, a, a movie for, um, oh, I, I, was, I was doing it in Breaking Bad, you know, I was in that. And yeah. so I auditioned for it. The great thing about audition, because first of all, I love the show, you know, so I'd be watching it. So I was a fan. So to, yeah, that's to awesome. get an audition for something you love, for a program that you love, and, oh, I'm going to audition for Breaking Day. That was like such a, a cool thing for, for me personally. Just wow. Uh, I, it wasn't even that, <clears throat> um, I mean, I didn't care if I, I got it or not. The very fact that I was going to audition for Breaking Bad was such a high. So I went in, and the uh, the other high was because I'm 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 by the way, I'm dyslexic. So my fear and hate of learning lines is endemic to me. I mean, yeah. dis my dyslexia has to do with memorization. Sure. It's not like memorization. It it, it scrambles stuff. Yeah. Uh, linear, linear, linear learning. I, I'm a, I'm an eidetic learner. I actually have to do it to learn it. I, you can't you can't tell me how to do it. I mean, you know, you can tell me, you know, push this button. Okay. You can tell me push that button and then that button. Okay. You can tell me to push that button and that button and that button. Okay. And then no. Yeah. <laughs> Fourth one. Uh, what comes after three? Four. <laughs> oh. Believe me, uh, I have so many yeah, notebooks filled with instructions for myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you yeah. go. There you go. That's how and I do I everything. Into, <laughs> yeah, and I wasn't into everything because I had a great memory. Yeah. But not so linear. In other words, I could memorize weird shit, but not linear. Okay, anyway, um, I got over that because I loved being in front of the camera and performing it, doing it, being there. Being there now, being here now, you know, which is all acting is. Really. And, and so uh, I pressed through that. So I, I auditioned, and the whole point about that is I only had five lines. So not only was I auditioning for the, you know my favorite show of all time, but I only had to memorize five lines. So you know, four lines, five lines. Okay, I can do it. Uh, it was it was easy. I didn't have to sweat for three nights memorizing and memorizing and memorizing. So I, I auditioned. There was nobody even there. It was just 
I went in. She said, you just want to do it? It was just one woman with a camera in, a, in an empty room. That was the audition. That's every audition and I've ever said, done. And she said, you want to do it? Uh, <laughs> excuse me, what? I said, that's every and audition I've there? ever done. I understand. <laughs> oh, well, sometimes there's a whole phalanx of people in the room. Sure, you know, I've heard about those. Depends yeah. on how I'm, Yeah. <sighs> so I went in and... She said, well, you want to, you, you know, I talked about it. You want to do it? So I was kind of disgusted at, at that point because I thought, oh, uh, I this is this is a throwaway audition. In other words, I wasn't, there wasn't enough people in the room. I, I thought it wasn't important enough oh. that they only gave, you know, one one woman who was, who sure. was obviously an assistant. And mm-hmm. the, in an empty room. I mean, there was only a chair and a tripod with a camera, a woman, and me. And, and that was it. It was an empty little room. Mm. So I kind of was, oh, they don't really care about this. This is this is a joke or a put on. Or... So I just said, no, I don't want to talk about it. She said, all right, you just want to do it? I go, yeah. So then she starts to read with me. Now, I don't know, when you audition... You generally have somebody read with you, not the person who's working the camera. Because she was working the camera, looking at the screen, reading her lines, but not paying any attention to me. Which, in my naivete, didn't tell me, you know, that's not important about her. It's, they're going to be looking at what's in the camera. You know, the, whoever's going to hire me. Hmm. He's going to not be, they don't even know who's reading with me. So you got to concentrate on just doing your part. It doesn't matter. She's not looking at you. She's reading lines. Mm-hmm. You know, that bothers. Anyway, I just did it. And then she says, okay, thank you very much. You know, I did my five lines. She says, okay, thank you very much. And I go, that's it? And she says, no, I don't know. You want to do it again? And I go, do I have to? And she says, no. I said, do you want me to do it again? And she says, mm, not really. And I go, okay, I'm out of here. She says, okay, fine. And I thought, well, there you go. There's my favorite show. Well, I, I did an audition, but see my face in it. And then the next day I got the call. Yeah, you're hired. <laughs> so that was cool. Here's, <laughs> here's the twist. Here's the twist. The twist is I get in my costume and I'm all, I'm so stoked. It's amazing. I've got my lines. It's only five. It's my favorite show. I like the part. And I walk into the, uh, uh, my my dressing room, and on the table on the dressing room table, generally your your lines. You, you they give you your your lines in case you want to read them over before you go out. So there's my little book, my little line, and I go on the first page of my lines. There's a speech as long as the page. There's a page long monologue on top of my five lines, and I say to the AD who led me in, I say, well, what, what's this? She's, oh, Vince liked you so much he wrote you a monologue. Huh? I go, no, no, you can understand. No, I can't do this. Man, I, I start to freak, man. I just start to lose it. And it is an AD, he's a kid, so he started to go, hey, man, I don't know what you're about this. I got to get back to the set. He's going to get out of there. He's like, oh, man, another actor's going to freak out on me. He just walked out, you know, something. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes, what? I said, how long do I have before I, I got to shoot this? two hours. I can't do this. I don't know about that, man. And he just walked out. So then I tried to memorize it, but obviously I couldn't. So that was, you know, that was the, the downside of being an actor and process. I, you know, I, 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 I didn't, I memorized it as best I could, which I couldn't really. I, I just wanted to tell you about fear and how dyslexia interrupts my great bliss of, you know, performing in front of the camera. The, the, the end of that scene, the end of that story is that when I got onto the set, I figured, well, I don't really know it, but if they break it up, because it's a long monologue, uh, they, if they break it up, I can, I can maybe, maybe manage it in sections, you know? And so I went to the director and I said, Hey, um, we're going to shoot this in sections, right? And he goes, no, no, we're going to shoot it a walk and talk. You know, just, uh, you'll get down there at the end of the, uh, it was at the, in, in a junkyard. He you get down there and walk towards the camera and we'll just do the whole thing in one take. And I go, oh, man. Okay, fine. He says, something wrong? 
Um, no, no, because I just figured out I'm going to get fired. I mean, there's just no way I can do it. I had given up. So I go down there, and he says, okay, you're ready? And I go, yeah, I'm ready. And he says, okay, you know, action, roll it. Larry, go. So I start walking, and I'm just talking. I'm, I'm just trying to remember pieces of it, or whatever. And it's a law thing. It's not law. It's not, you know. Why this cop can't look in the Winnebago under the, under, under, legally under the law because he doesn't have a search warrant and I'm the owner of the property. Mm -hmm. and, but it's all legally. And I'm just talking and talking. And then I figure, okay, at the end of this, when I get to the finish line, I'm going to be fired. And I get to the end and he, the director just goes, okay, let's do that again, Larry. I go, what? Did I just memorize that? He didn't say anything. He just says, no, let's do it again. I go, okay. Fine, so I'm not, I'm not mentioning that. I go back all the way back. And I thought, well, he probably got this. I don't have to worry about the second take. I'll just relax and do it again, you know. So I relax and I, uh, so I go back to the spot. And now I see the, um, what do you call it, the, uh, the script girl? Yeah. The one who, you know, I see the script girl coming to me with pencil poised. That's a bad sign. <laughs> because when she's coming to you, she's she's going to tell you the word that you missed or the line that you missed. That's why she's coming over to you. I know that. So she comes up to me and she says, "I go okay. What did I what did I miss?" And she says, and she she shows me the script. Practically every other word is circled, and she says, "You, you got to say it the way it's written." And I go, "Look, let me talk to Vince." You know, right away, I'm getting defensive. I want to talk to Vince. <laughs> Vince is not here. I said, okay, then then let me talk to, let me talk, did Vince write this? And, and she said, no, Vince didn't. She, she just wanted this written for you. I go, okay, let me talk to the writer. Um, she said, the writer is the director, and he wants you to read it. As written. I go, oh, okay. All right. So now again, I'm being fired again. So I go back and he says, is there something wrong, Larry? He shouts at the end of his walk. I go, no, it's okay, fine. He goes, okay, let's roll it. So I just did it again, the exact same thing. Blah, 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 boom. And then he says, okay, thank you very much, Larry. Moving on. And I go, what the hell just happened, man? <laughs> I could not figure it out. And then I was wrapped. And I put the other part of my scene I had already shot. That was the five lines. Yeah. That, that I had already done. So I just wrapped and they took me back and I went home. And I, I, so when I watched the show, my friends, the, the name of my friend's company is Movies is Magic. That's the name of this production company. And this is why he named it that. When I watch the show, because I want to see what the heck, I'm, what they did was, and he knew all along, this director, this writer-director, I guess he's really brilliant. Um, what they did was, okay, here's the setup. Uh, Ryan Cranston and uh, Aaron Paul are in the Winnebago hiding. The guy I'm talking to is a cop who wants to look in the Winnebago. And I don't want them to because they paid me to keep that cop away from the Winnebago. So I got to talk him out of it legally. That you can't be here unless you have a search warrant. It's a long speech. Here's what they, how they filmed it. My first two lines they are on me walking. Then they cut inside to Brian and Aaron whispering to themselves. <laughs> And, but you hear my voice over, over there whispering. And then you cut to the cop listening to me back inside, one line to me. And they kept on, the director kept on doing it. So basically what he did was he knew I couldn't memorize it, or I wasn't going to be able to memorize it. So he had me do it twice. And he edited together the legalese that he needed to keep the cop out of the Winnebago. And then he just stayed on Aaron and uh, Brian and the cop and cut to me every time I got a good line that, you know, fit what he needed. 
<laughs> and movies is magic. You yeah. look at it, and I, I, I went to my friends the next day because I was blown away by the genius of movies is magic. And I said to my friends, hey, did you watch me last night? So I asked about three different friends at three different times during the day. I said, did you see you know me last night? Or, yeah, man, you were so cool, man. That was really great. I said, what did you see? What do you mean? What, what did you see when, when, you, when you watched my scene there, you know, with the Winnebago? Well, you were walking and you were talking this illegal leaves crap, you know, and they were in the, the Winnebago and you were talking to the cop. Yeah, but but was it me talking? Yeah, you were walking, you were talking this illegal leaves like, No, man. What do you mean? Watch it again. I'm on screen maybe for 10 seconds or less. It's all on them and the cop. They just cut to me for a, a line. There's no shit. No, yeah, and all three of them, and if you ask anybody who watches that scene, they'll say, yeah, you just walked and talked, and you were talking, and they were hiding. Hey, you, the way it was edited, it, you are convinced it's me all the time. No, it isn't, because I'm on screen for 10 seconds. So, I mean, that's just brilliant. I mean, that just blew my mind about, oh, editing, man. Film is editing. You know, you can have a so lousy... Nice. And what? Yeah. So nice for the, there to be an editor. Well, <laughs> well, that, but, but a lot of the actors, a lot of the stars, because I've worked with them, I, I, I'm always asking questions. You know, they say, yeah, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing. They, they protect you if your part is important enough. You know, where you're saying a plot line or, or you, your character is very important. They'll protect you in, in the editing room. You know, I, a lot of, you know, big stars have said to me, you know, I've never been bad after they edit me. You know, so I, I, I <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, they don't, the audience doesn't know what they threw away, which is, you know, when you're an actor, you don't think that way. Yeah. You know, they'll, they'll see every bad time I screwed up. No, they threw that away. They, the audience has no idea how bad you actually were. <laughs> you know, it doesn't occur. So that was that was another great, you know, uh, I guess, epiphany of how, of how to do it. So we've talked. Uh, to, we were talking a lot about your um, improv background, and we've uh, sort of got right. to the point where you're headed to Hollywood. But that's a that's a big old chunk. So I, I guess I just have a couple of questions about it. Uh, with reference to okay. something that you mentioned, you mentioned creative process and how important it is right. for you. When you moved into film and television and that kind of like industry situation, I imagine it's a lot different than doing the live theater shows that you had been doing for years and years before that. How were you able to like get back into a comfortable creative process um, while also dealing with the, you know, sort of ups and downs of Hollywood as an industry and you just trying to get jobs? Um, with difficulty uh, is the, the short answer. Um, <laughs> I couldn't get used to the oh, comparatively over-the-top acting on stage compared to the movies, which is totally real, man. Yeah. You know, be here now. So it, it was very difficult. So again, I, it was a learning curve that I just wasn't into. Uh, although I did want to be in movies because there was what the money was. And when I did do it well, like the sitcoms, see, I, I, I cut my acting teeth on sitcoms where you can be broad. Yeah, They're not, not over the top, but broad. Uh, especially Laverne and Shirley. And so the, in the beginning, I was in the broad comedies. And then as the comedy started to get realer in the acting department and the writing department uh, over uh, three or four years, because you don't act that many. In over three or four years, you may have five or ten jobs. Or, yeah. you know, eight or, I, I don't, you know, in other words, it was a slow process because the work comes in slow where you can practice what you think you've learned. Uh, so it took me years. And then my agents wanted me to start getting serious. They were starting to send me up to serious roles. And that was a, a big 
failure, really, in the beginning. I mean, I could, I just couldn't make the leap between um, broad and real uh, to do the real acting. Uh, so I would get like very small parts, uh, you know, maybe with a plot line where I would get a close up. So it was an important part, but, but, uh, so I, it was short where I could kind of relax and be real for a very short time to see, to get used to it. So in that way, it was, it was a kind learning process. And also, I didn't get the big, real, serious roles because my audition wasn't real and serious. It was kind of broad, too broad for what they were looking for. Until I finally got it. You know, I auditioned enough serious roles and failed to start to understand. Just like stand-up comedy, you know, you do it and do it and you're bad and bad and somehow I, I, I learn. I'm, I'm a learner. A slow learner, okay, but a learner nonetheless. I do learn. And you got to know that about yourself. You know, I don't really, if, if I want to do something, I'll, I'll hang in there. You know, and my desire to be a, a serious actor starts to click in. And then finally, you know, I mean, and, and the, the piece de resistance of all that was a couple of months ago, you know, when, when I did Barry and I did a really serious role in a backstory. That was the first time I ever, ever created a backstory for a, a role that I, a serious role. I never, because improv, you know, it's a backstory, you know, doctor, you got it, boom, you know, whatever, pilot, boom, you got it, you know, just instant. Uh, so, and I would always do that, even, I never get a backstory, yeah, maybe a little, but for Barry, and, and so that was like very, uh, w when Bill Hader is a great director, by the way, as all the great directors are, and the reason is that they know what they're doing and they know how to get the best out of you. That's, uh, you know, they don't tell you what to do. They get the best out of you. You become the best you. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so with Barry and Bill Hader, he never said one thing to me the entire time. I was sweating that. Because Woody Allen does the same thing, and a lot of it. John Hughes does the same thing. I've worked with a lot of great directors, but great ones never say a word, unless you're doing something that's just not what they had in, not even what they had in mind. So that's, that will help tell their story. I mean, uh, John Huston said uh, acting is 80% casting. Mm -hmm. other, you you pick the right guy and leave him alone, or pick the right woman and leave her alone. Just let her do her thing because that's why you cast her. That's why you even wanted her for him, and you just let them go. And then if because they're doing and the thing, you know, exactly. Oh wow, I never thought of that. Um, the great directors like you to blow their minds or change their mind. They, they like you to take a chance. Come on, man, you know. <laughs> I, you know, I don't need what's been done. I need, you know, and, and all the good ones, the great ones, the media, and they, or, or it's like Larry David. He actually got it out of me. I mean, he's, he was amazing. That was the, one of the most amazing things. Larry David, when I did, um, uh, uh, Seinfeld. Uh, Seinfeld. Yeah, Seinfeld. Um, I, I did, I, I get on stage, you know, I, I did, you know, we were shooting it, and then he came over to me. He, uh, he, he coaches. He's a side coach. just like Viola. Uh, <laughs> not in the middle of the shot, but like, you know, in the rehearsal. So he, he, um, he, he says, you know, he says to Tom, the director, he's Tom, I want to talk. And he also takes you aside, which is kind of nice. A lot of the great directors do that. They put you aside. They don't give you in front of everybody. They pull you aside. I always loved that. Oh, I wish the director would pull me aside and give me a little talk. So he pulled me aside. Yeah, Larry David pulled me aside. So I want to talk to you for a second here, Larry. And I go, oh, great. He's going to talk to me. Great. And he goes, I know what you're doing. Very accusing me. I know what you're doing. No, he said, I know what you're trying to do. And that bugged me when he said the word, How, what am I? So I said to him very defensively, yeah, what, what am I trying to do? And he said, 
you're trying to do nothing. And that blew my mind. I go, wow, right, you're right. It just surprised me. I go, wow, you're right. That's exactly what I was trying to do. And what I was trying to do with the Seinfeld thing, you know, Tom Pepper, the guy who's still in the racing, is I was trying to be, Buster, I had Buster Keaton in mind. I was trying to totally underplay the writing and the character. Because it was a very well-written, powerful, little piece. Yeah. So I, and I, and I go, wow, you're, you're, you're right. I, that's exactly what I was trying to do. And he said, well, you're doing something. And he walked away. <laughs> wow, that's the greatest piece of directing I've ever had. <laughs> it was. So I go, wow, cool. So he goes, all right. You know, he turns it over to Tom, and Tom says, okay, let's do it again. So I do it again. I got that in mind. Blah, blah, blah. No. Don't do anything. To me. So I do the scene. And he got in cut and he said, and then I see at the out of the corner of my eye, Larry David is sitting towards me, but he's walking like he's going to walk past me. So I didn't even think about it. So he did. He walked past me. And as he walked past me, he just brushed by my ear real quick. And he said, he's going to go And he just walked by. So I said, this guy is so cool, man. Uh, so I did even less, and then you know the next take was cool, and, and it's, uh, everybody remembers that part. You know, everybody yeah. knows me as, as "Hey, did you steal the raisins?" And all I was trying to do was nothing. And Larry David got me there. That's that's a director. Yeah. That's what a director. He didn't tell me how to do it. He didn't tell me what to do. He just said, mm, "I know what you're doing, and here's how to get there." Right. Yeah, but, but it was just succeed. You do you, well. You're doing something. You're still doing it. Cool. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so I don't know. You know. But, but finally, those kind of things finally got me from the the broad stage persona to being here now, real. You know, don't pretend. Don't act. Don't indicate. Just be. Yeah. You know. And 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 I've talked to a lot of actors, and they all have different ways of getting there. You know, Lee Strasberg or Uta Hagen or Larry David, or, you know, whatever. Viola Spoman. However, you get there, but you know, you just, uh, that's all I know. I mean, about hmm. acting. I'm not an actor. I'm a comedian who does other things well enough to get by. Yeah. Well, speaking of those other things, you also have a book coming out. How did you get to the point where you started writing down these stories? How did you decide to start this book? Well, I've and... always, I've always written. I mean, when I was an actor, you have a lot of downtime, and you either, you know, get something to do or start robbing gas stations. I mean, you got a lot of energy that's uh, just out there. Yeah. Uh, so I just would write or make films or whatever. Whatever I would get, I started using my uh, acting money as an ATM. I, if I would get any money, you know, because I, I was a single guy, I, you know, if I got any money, I would make a film. You know, uh, I would get a lot of money sometimes just as a, uh, an idea man sometimes. Somebody would say, hey, I just, I'm writing a screenplay. I just need somebody to bounce ideas off of. And they would give me a lot of money. I would just immediately, I could do a lot of coke or whatever was going on. Or I can make a film, and I always thought, no, nah, man, a, a film, the highest gone in, you know, a couple of hours, but this film will be around for a while. So I'd always just make a little film with the money. That, that, that's, uh, that's what I would do. Um, and I, forgot, sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, the book. So I would <laughs> write it. So I, I would just write fables and stories and funny stuff just at, at night or, you know, when I had nothing to do or a couple of days with no, nothing to do. I would write this stuff and then finally I put it together for a one-man show, uh, which I, I started to do randomly whenever I had like a month off. I would rehearse it, take all these writings, and I would tell stories on stage or do these uh, monologues and rants about homeless, being a homeless character. I had this homeless character, Emmett. And so I would write Emmett Ranch, you know, funny little homeless thing. Because I lived homeless for a year in San Francisco. I lived in my car for a year. So I got into the homeless thing, and I got that down. I was pretty good at being homeless. I could have stayed homeless. 
it's a long time. <laughs> that's a danger. Okay, that's that's one of the dangers of being homeless. If you're homeless for a long time, a year, if you're homeless for a year, your brain starts to change. I bet. I mean, it's just, hey, man, adapt. It adapts. Yeah. And so you get good at it. If you get good enough, you think, hey, man, this is where I belong. Woo! That's crazy. Yeah. I, just, I was on the cusp of that, and I just got out. But So I started writing about it, and that was great. And so I'm, I'm very glad. I mean, I don't regret that, that time. I, I just incredibly amount of new information. So I was writing all that and doing it on stage, and then finally... I couldn't afford, you know, renting a venue or advertising it, and, you know, not packing the house, so I was losing money, and blah blah blah. So I said, oh, I'm gonna write. I'll put it all in the book. So that that book is my the, is the writings of, of my tables and stories and oral histories of Emmett and uh, its political satire, it's satire, it's satire and funny stories, all, all those writings. I just put into a book, and it's called the Loopholes Dossier. Uh, and uh, that's one of the stories. It's a uh, political satire. And there's fables and doggerel poems and, uh, and unrequited love. It's just, it's great. It's a great book. And it's coming out, it's, it's out now in ebooks. You can order it and it'll be delivered, I think, on the 11th, October. Uh, September, no, September, uh, 18th or something. You can order it now and it will be delivered up, uh, September 18th. And then the hardcover, which is really beautiful, it's got, uh, my illustrations. I drew the, uh, the book with my industrial yeah. design at days. I, I drew the cartoons and the illustrations. That's and so they're in color. It's a great book. It's a really good book. What a wonderful, uh, so that's, like, uh, that's, creative project. Well, but that's what I do. You know, if I get yeah. bored, you know, you start thinking, what can I do with my downtime? So I'll make a little film. I don't have money. I'll write a little film. I'll write another chapter to my next book. Or, uh, or you know, so start that's thinking what you do, huh? I mean, I I talk to people a lot, and one of the things I like to ask people, especially when we get towards the end, which we are, is like what you do when you, you know, have a creative lull or a creative block. Um, do you just keep busy to get through that? Like it doesn't, you know, you don't have lulls or blocks. You just kind of keep doing project after project well, after project? Well, uh, because I guess because it's such Sagittarius, I mean, but I don't know. That's just, you know, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> I have a lot of different interests. I, I, I my, my brain never shuts down, really. I got a, you know, Dylan, I got a head full of ideas that are driving me insane. You know, that's, I mean, I, I understand that line. And, uh, it, it's not driving me insane, but, it, but because I have very many interests, and I do absorb, if something is interesting, I'll just absorb it. Uh, and if I'm not interested, then you can't get it in my head. But, so, when I finish or get tired of writing, like I'm, I'm, I'm correcting a little screenplay that I wrote. So I'm, I'm correcting that. So, you know, after I two or three hours or four hours, whatever, of correcting it and writing it, and I get bored, I go, okay, put it down. And... Maybe it's two in the morning and I'm still not sleepy. So, yeah, I'm tired and I can't write anymore. I can't do this. But I can't play my guitar. So I'll write a song. <laughs> and that, that, all of a sudden, my energy is there for writing, for, for playing a, a guitar. So maybe I can't write a song, but I'll learn a new chord or I'll learn, learn, learn a new riff. And so I'll either be tired and go to sleep. Or if I'm still, you know, then, well, I can't play the guitar and I can't write it. Oh, that's boring. You know, I'm not going to go out for a walk. It's maybe too cold or something. It's raining. So I'll, oh, I know. I can, uh, I can paint a picture. Mm-hmm. And I, so I have this, you know, so I do some painting. Mm-hmm. Uh, online, I, you did digitally. I, I paint digitally. Cool. So I can do that. You know, in other words, but it's not, it's not forced. It's like, oh. Uh, well, what can I do? You know, well, it's okay. And it's just, in other words, to me, creativity is just like another thing to do, like going for a walk or riding my bike. It's not like, oh, I'm doing art now and I'm riding a bike now and exercising. It is, to me, it's, it's, well, I'll ride my bike, I'll write a book, I'll 
look, I'll do that. I'll talk to a friend. I'll go have coffee. It's just, you know, you know what are you going to do with your time? And I have a lot of options. It's the options, I guess. That, that it's, A lot of people don't really have options. They just get bored. Yeah. I mean, bored is just time where you don't know what to do with it. It's, it, it's a thing like anything else. Boredom is a thing. It's unfulfilled. It's like anger. Anger is just unfulfilled energy that's bouncing around inside of you. That's all. If you're doing enough things or if you're really tired, how can you get angry? It's energy that's just un- untapped. So if something triggers you, bam, all that comes out. Hmm. So I just let it out by just doing a lot of stuff. You know, some of it's good, some of it's bad. I'm just going through a lot of these little films I did, one-minute films, three-minute films. So I'm going through, I got about 100 of them. I just bank them. I mean, over the years, this is not something I did last week. I just, you know, bank them. You know, so, you know. so I was looking through them the other day. A lot of them are, you know, not worth showing to anybody. And every once in a while, a little gem comes up. So again, it's like the editing process of actors. If I pick out just you know one out of a one out of fifty is worth showing to a friend. So if I have three hundred, that's you know that's six. Yeah. six gems. Well, if I destroy the other you know two hundred and four, then nobody knows they ever existed. And I show these six to my friends, they think I'm a genius. You know, they didn't see the three hundred. That really what are you stupid? <laughs> it's very simple. Uh, the editing process of the mind or how you look at what you're doing. Yeah. So then because there's no failure, I just, well, this one didn't work. If I do a hundred more, I mean, I'm exaggerating. You, you understand that. Yeah. But, uh, but the point, the point yeah. that I'm making is I just do stuff. That's all. It's you know? great. And I just try to do stuff that doesn't get me in trouble because I, that was a, I was a pyromaniac when I was a kid. I got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, enough. I, I, enough. Okay, I get it. I mean, I finally, know. you got to get it. I bet you you could meet some <laughs> stunt guys now and do some good pyro stuff. You probably get some good connections well, yeah, in yeah, the yeah, pyro yeah. world but, now if you wanted to get back into it. Not that I'm suggesting. <laughs> right. Okay, now wait a minute. What? What time is it? You know? What time is it right now? I have yeah. a meeting. Okay. It's, well, I think I, I, think I got to go. You got to go. It's good. Holy we cow. are yeah, we're, cool. we are good. You have told me some great stories. Thank you so much for being on the podcast and telling me oh, your great stories. You, You've been, um, it's just really great to talk to you and to hear all of the adventures that you've been through. I appreciate you sharing me uh, a moment of your time. Oh, well, it, 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 I, I love talking to you because, you know, you're kind of a kindred soul. You, you know what I'm talking about. So it's kind of, <laughs> kind of a relief. Thanks for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all our episodes on YesButWhyPodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at HCUniversalNetwork.com.